Okay, so we move to our next talk. Uh, please welcome Aaron, who will speak about uh, JPEG 2000. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Aaron, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, JPEG 2000. Um, just a show of hands, has anyone ever intentionally s stored an image as JPEG 2000? <laughs> okay, that's impressive. Um, so it was actually designed to replace JPEG. Um, it had never, about 20 years ago, but never really made it. Um, but I, it's been one of my obsessions for the last five years, and I think it's actually the codec of the future, and that's what we'll go into today. Um, so to understand JPEG 2000, we have to go back to its predecessor, JPEG. And I'm going to take you back into the 90s to the rise of JPEG. So um, this was standardized in 1992. And um, it really came of age with the internet, as, uh, with the dawn of the internet. And by the end of the 90s, uh, about a quarter of the internet traffic was uh, JPEGs. Now, um, we all know that was mostly porn. But uh, still, that was, that was an important uh, way of, 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 of rising up uh, in the internet. And now we all have a JPEG encoder, a decoder in our pockets, in our phones. So it was an extremely successful standard. But um, there were some issues. So um, here you have, on the right, a picture of a flower. And you can see um, this is about a one bit per sample um, image. So you can see the block artifacts that you get um, in these that you've all seen over here, because um, JPEG uses an 8x8 eight eight, uh, pixel block to do its compression. And so um, when you get very low bit rates, you start to see the boundaries around the, um, the pixel blocks, the 8x8 eight eight pixel blocks. So that's a big problem. Um, another issue is that it's only lossy. So if you need lossless compression, uh, you can't use JPEG. There is, another, there is a lossless standard for JPEG, but um, nobody really uses it. And it's a completely different codec framework. So, um, which is an ideal. Um, we're also limited to eight bits. So if you wanted to do medical or um, remote sensing, you can't use JPEG for that. Um, more limitations are you can only use three components. Um, the limit, there's limits on the dimensions of the image uh, to 16 bit. And um, one of the big issues is, is uh, rate control. So the only way to actually uh, target a specific rate for an image is to continually recompress until you get to down to that target image. And um, each time you recompress, you're losing data. So it's really not ideal. Um, so those were the limits um, that gave rise to JPEG 2000, uh, which was supposed to address uh, these limitations. But it also added a whole bunch of new features, which I'm going to go into um, in a moment. So. Um, only six years after JPEG was standardized, uh, this uh, JPEG 2000, they began to standardize JPEG 2000. Um, it was based on the work by David Taubman, his thesis work. Uh, those are the monikers for um, the ITU and ISO uh, standards. And it is royalty free. He, uh, Taubman actually donated his IP so that he would make sure that it was a royalty free codec. And. Um, when you introduce a new codec, you, um, you definitely want to have better image compression than the original. So it, that is, in fact, the case. Um, so JPEG 2000 has up to 200% um, better performance than JPEG, meaning you get smaller images for the same, um, uh, um, same, same, same bit rate or same uh, signal-to-noise ratio. Um, but besides that, um, you look at the um, artifacts between these two images. It's, the, it's, uh, about a, it's a one bit per sample image of the Lena image, but you see um, on the right is JPEG 2000. Um, because of the transform for JPEG 2000, we do a wavelet transform versus a 8 by 8 uh, transform for JPEG. So when you lose data, you just blur the image. Uh, you don't get those um, pixelated artifacts in JPEG. So that was um, a big advantage for the new standard. And also, it supports lossy and lossless in one framework, um, which is nice. The only difference between lossy and lossless is um, the transform is a little different for lossy. And there is quantization where you lose data. But otherwise, the, fr the framework is exactly the same. Um, and then you can get visually lossless uh, 
encoding where there is loss of data, but you can't, uh, the human eye can't detect the difference. So that's um, visually, <coughs> excuse me, visually lossless. Um, one of the big innovations, though, is the progression um, that it introduces. So um, progression is used by a, a codec to, um, so that the decoder can do a partial decode of the image and still get something useful out of it. Um, and here, this is what people are mostly familiar with, is a progression by quality. So you can see that image of the butterfly being downloaded um, and already by the first, second or third frame, you can start to see something useful even though you've only downloaded about 8% of the image. So um, JPEG 2000 allows you to um, create quality layers and that you can um, and package up those layers. And if you progress by quality, you can um, progressively download and get a useful image when you haven't downloaded the the complete result. And this is how we do it. Um, so that's an image of a, a castle in eight bits. So these are the bit planes for all the bits in, in each of those samples. So that's, the, so that's the most significant bit over there. And so we create these bit planes, and each plane is compressed. Uh, there's three different passes that we run through the, through the plane to compress it. So it's very computationally expensive, but we create many different uh, layers or, or um, passes for that image that we can then package up into different quality layers. And you get a very fine-grained uh, set of quality layers that you can break the image up into. And, and that's um, a graph of the distortion as you build up the bit plane. So um, for an 8-bit image, you could have 23 different passes, and each pass can be packaged up in different quality layers using this EBCOT, which is um, the formula, the algorithm for, de for determining these quality layers. And, um, and so that was a big innovation. Um, but there's three other different ways of progressing in JPEG 2000. This is progression by resolution. So that's a, that's a wavelet uh, transform of this image. We, we do low and high pass filters on the X and Y coordinates. And so we actually, uh, on the top left, you get a low res thumbnail of the original image, and then high pass, high, high pass um, bands. They're called subbands. So there's four different subbands. And so built in, baked into the codec, you have lower resolution replicas of the original image without any redundancy. And we would do this wavelet transform maybe four or five times. So you could, inside the actual image, there are multiple lower resolution replicas that you could then, as you're decoding, um, you could um, bring those images out without actually storing extra data as a thumbnail. It's actually built in. So you can progress by resolution um, if, you, if that's how you encode it. Um, there's also a progression by spatial region. Uh, you can see these are the, the original subbands that we had from the wavelet, these big blue boxes. And then inside we have the precincts, and inside the precincts we have the code blocks. And so you can actually um, encode by precinct and store the image um, progressing that way. And that's useful for, let's say you have a scanner. Let's say you're limited by memory. You might want to uh, encode one um, precinct at a time and then move on. Um, and it's also useful for random access into the, into the image. Uh, and the final one is progression by component. So if it's an RGB image, you can um, break it down into your uh, luminance and your chroma channels, and you can progress by those channels. And if you're a grayscale printer, maybe you can just throw away the chroma and keep the luminance. So that's, that's another progression that you can get. Uh, there's a bunch of other features that you, you have in JPEG 2000. One is er error resilience. So you built into the code stream when you're encoding it, you, can, you have to terminate each code stream segment. And you can terminate those segments in a way that when the decoder is decoding those segments, it can tell whether there's been an error in the segment. And um, also, we have these precincts that contain uh, errors in the code. So if there's an error in one precinct, it can't migrate into the next precinct. So we contain errors that way. Um, we also have recompression resilience. So typically, an image might be compressed and decompressed multiple times. And so uh, the codec is, doesn't lose a lot of information for the, for the subsequent compression and recompression, like decode and decode. So 
it's, um, it's a, that's another feature to have that we have. Um, and then you get random access into the code stream from if you do a progression by code block. So if you have an enormous image from a remote sensing, let's say you want to just decode a small piece of the image, you can actually put markers into the code so that you can locate that particular region of the image and decode that, which is useful for, for huge images. Um, we also do low latency because it's an intracodec, so each frame is encoded individually, and so you can um, get very low latency, unlike, uh, for example, H.264, where you have groups of pictures that are encoded together. Each frame is encoded separately, and you can get low latency that way. Um, also a region of interest where you just increase the quality in a certain part of the image. You, let's say you're doing um, uh, video conferencing, you want to focus on the face, so that's um, built in as well. Um, so, with all these cool features, um, who adopted J2K? Um, first of all, with medical imaging, it's uh, considered the gold standard because you can do lossless, which is important for legal issues, and you can do high bit rates, like 10, 12, and 16 bits. Uh, so, medical imaging, it's popular in remote sensing because you can support 16,000 components, if you like, so, and very large dimensions, so it's popular there. Um, and also, few people realize that whenever you watch a movie, you're actually watching JPEG 2000 decoding because it's the standard for digital cinema. And the reason is because of that resolution by, by um, a progression by resolution, because the 4K image that you encode has a 2K image built in. So the 2K projector can actually just decode the um, low-level subband and throw away the rest. So it's backwards compatible, and that's... Um, used, it's a standard today. Um, and so what went wrong uh, with all these wonderful features? Yes, there is an XKCD comic for this. Um, well, first of all, patents. Um, there was a company called Lizard Tech, which uh, claimed all wavelet-based codecs were there, were there, that you had to license from them, and that was eventually invalidated, but that was caused some f FUD for the emerging standard. Microsoft was uh, the monopoly in those days, and they had their competing standard called XR, JPEG XR. So they didn't support JPEG 2000. Um, there was browser support was poor. Even, uh, this is 2015, you can see only 20% of the browsers support the standard. And um, hardware support, um, the hardware vendors were waiting for the software uh, people to um, be able to display the images, and software vendors were waiting for the hardware to produce those images. So it, they never really supported them in hardware. And finally, performance. It, this, uh, because of the complexity of the codec, it's very, very slow. Because of all those passes through all those bit planes, it's a very, very complex codec. And so it was very slow, um, and with it, JPEG was already there, so that was good enough. So um, those were all the reasons why it never really made it. Um, now, there's been a change in the codec to address the performance um, called High Throughput JPEG 2000. And um, they keep everything the same, and they change the block coder, which is the piece at the very center uh, of the codec that actually creates the bit stream. And that's what, what creates all those bit planes and all those passes. So they've simplified the block coder and um, this gives you uh, a big speed increase, uh, 10 times possibly. And it was standardized this year, uh, sorry, last year, 2019. And so it's also royalty free. And um, the difference is that it's actually friendly for uh, GPUs and vector calculations, which was different than the original encoder, which was designed when actually multiplication was expensive. Uh, so they tried to avoid multiplication by creating branches and, and, and doing a very serial approach. And so that doesn't really work on modern hardware. So this one is designed um, with SIMD in mind. Um, there are fewer passes, and you just sacrifice the quality scalability that you had from the original JPEG, but everything else is the same. And um, you can also losslessly transcode between the two formats. So you can uh, encode it one way it, for speed and then later convert it to the original for um, distribution. And they're trying, there is a decoder in it by, within Scripton that will hopefully address the browser issues that they had with the original standard. 
Um, these are the open source toolkits. OpenJPEG is the, uh, the granddaddy of J2K toolkits. Uh, there's Grok, which is one that I maintain. Um, and there's something called OpenJPH, which is only for um, high throughput JPEG 2000. And any questions? I, I, I have a lot of time for questions. We have questions from um, the online uh, forum. A lot of questions about JPEG access. Right. Actually, I had slides for JPEG access, and I took them out because I, I thought I would be going over time. But um, so, so, yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so JPEG access is actually a competing standard for the same space. It's based on a wavelet transform. It's also low complexity low latency. Uh, the big difference is that it's actually a patented standard. It's being promoted by Intupix and Fraunhofer, the people who brought you the MP3 patents. Um, they are wait hoping to license that. So I'm hoping that the um, open solution is going to win. But they're, they're in the same space. And actually, from what I've heard, the um, J2K is actually faster uh, than the um, than the JPEG XS, and it's actually the image quality is is higher for the same bit rates. So, um, so it looks promising. But that that is a competing standard in the same space. Um, how do you think? Both are about the JPEG XS. Any questions right. on the floor? Yeah. What about the new uh, JPEG standard called XL with the Google algorithm that will start next year? How fits it in your scheme? Is it, it, that's called XR? XL, right? They have the they, they like the X's. Please, please the oh, so the, oh, so the, sorry. The question is, um, how will the new JPEG XL standard compare with JPEG 2000? Yeah. Um, actually, I'm not. I, I actually don't. Not familiar with the XL standard, so um, I, I can't really comment on that. But um, uh, that's a new um, compression algorithm from some people from Google. And Compatible with JPEG, but has complicated, but has additional features from uh, JPEG to sell. Really? Um, yeah. Well, um, yeah. I, I I can't really. It's hard oh. to say, but it's. Um, I mean, the more standards. I think. I mean, the nice thing about standards is there's so many to choose from, okay. and um, so I, I think it'll be. It's. It's. We're actually in a, in a renaissance of JPEG of JPEG standards, and there's 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 XT, I think, which is. Com Backwardsly compatible with JPEG, but adds HDR and things like that. So I think I think it's a good thing, but I, I'd have to learn more about this codec to comment. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, it's like a kind of a scalable codec that, that you can kind of extract low resolution uh, images from uh, from a file. Uh, can you just uh, stop downloading at a point and get a lower resolution image out of that? We're kind of uh, interested in that for. for Game. Yeah. So the question is, um, would is it possible to uh, decode an image um, starting with the lower resolution first and progressing upwards? Is that? And, and you start part with. Yes. So you can start. Um, so you, yeah, that's that's the whole. Yeah. Yes, you can. So that's the whole point of progression: is the way if you encode it and store it. By resolution, then you can actually it, you can actually choose. I only want the lowest two or three resolutions, and you throw away everything else. And you can only you may not even just send that low resolution piece. So yeah, it's it's designed to do that. So. On, on that point, can you store just the first part of the file and, uh, and literally drop the re remainder? You can. And have that same effect. Um, oh, so sorry. The the question is: ca Is it possible to only? <laughs> Truncate by resolution and then throw away the rest. Um, well, you mean from the encoder to, to actually encode? Uh, in terms of if you wanted to store lower resolution textures, you could literally store the first ten percent of the file if that data is held in a linear in that linear fashion. Um, you would not be. Comp I think you if you encode, it wouldn't really be compliant because the the header would say I have ten resolutions and you've only ch stored three. But most of the decoders are used to handling all. Um, um, abuse of the standard, and so they will um, handle that. They will only decode, and you could you could store it. It would be decoded 
it, they might complain about it, but they they would decode those lower. So it's that's that you could you could definitely do that. And there's actually a, a, a I didn't go into it. There's a there's something called JPIP, which is a progressive format for for doing this. Actually, there's a, for 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 sending it over the wire. There's actually a, a, a standard part of the JPEG 2000 standard for doing progressive um, uh, 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 sending it progressively over the, the, the network. Yes. Oh. I yeah, I think be, yes. Yeah, I wanted to speak for a long time. <laughs> oh, so the question is: Is JPEG 2000 available as MXF? So, um, so MXF is the exchange format. For, um, so yes, so MSF, MXF supports JPEG 2000, and so you could you could package it. Um, um, well, this is very new, so I think you'll be getting. I don't think MXF supports it. They're going to be adding it to MXF. I, I know that, and they're going to be adding it to the digital cinema standard. And I think everyone's going to be adopting this because it's uh, just. Uh, fixes some problems and doesn't really have much of a downside for those workflows because because you don't need the progression by quality so much for for, for in that um, workflow. So, um, but MXF, yeah, I don't think it supports because it was just uh, end of last year that they they standardized the high throughput. So, it, but I think it will come. Yeah. So the question is, how much slower is JPEG 2000 versus JPEG? Um, it depends a lot on the implementations. So, um, the, for example, OpenJPEG was really, in terms of open source co um, toolkits, so, so David Taubman has his own codec that's um, uh, closed codec called Kakadu, um, which has always been very fast and had all the features. And the open source toolkits were slow and, and filled with bugs. Uh, for the longest time, but recently um, they've gotten quite fast. So they now support multi-threading. They've they've tried to optimize them. Um, so I don't have actual numbers, but um, on a, on a modern machine with a good with even with Open JPEG or with my uh, toolkit, um, I think you're you're looking at maybe t t twice as slow for the J2K. But with the with a with a new high throughput, I think we could actually get faster. Than JPEG because it's designed for um, GPU and for for vector operations. So I think we can actually get faster than JPEG, which is going to be really cool. I think. Yes. Can you? Can, sorry. Can you repeat? Okay. So the question is, how, what's the expected encode time for? For uh, it, would, it would depend on the size of the image and a 4K, a 4K image. Um, okay. So uh, on modern hardware, um, so so t so now you, you could get you could encode that. Okay, encoding. Yeah, see the some of the the codecs they don't focus on encoding; they focus on decoding. And encoding is slow. It actually, OpenJPEG gets single threaded, but um, so encoding a 4K image. Um, it's like an 8-bit, 8-bit uh, image or a 12-bit, 8-bit. Um, I guess maybe you could do it um, uh, 10, 15 frames per second on a, on a, on a modern machine. And, and with the multi-core, with the you know with the new uh, thread rippers and all that, you can really get a good performance. But um, it's it would it would really depend a lot on the image, and the content and how compressible it is and um, how many cores and all all that. But um, you can, you could get maybe 10, 15 frames per second encoding on, on a modern CPU, and the, and the decoder could be even um, maybe 20 frames per second decoding of 4K, which is, and the, and the high throughput is maybe three or four times faster than that when you do the whole encoding. The block coder is much faster, but the whole codec is going to be um, significantly faster. Last question. Yes. So the question is: Is encoding uh, and decoding different in terms of speed? Um, there's actually 
there are actually some tricks you can do in encoding that you don't, you can't do in decoding. Meaning, because you know the whole, you actually know all the pixels in a, in a, it, it, you actually know all the pixels that you're going to be encoding before you're encoding them. So you can actually do some tricks to speed things up. But um, I think um, decoding is going to be faster than the encoding. Yeah. It's, it's the way it's designed because most you usually decode many times. You only encode one time, so um, it should be. It, it depends on a lot of other factors, um, how they implemented it and, and that sort of thing. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, thank you. Thank you.